but she's been Protestant chaplain and lecturer in the Department of Religion at Hamilton College. She's te teaching informal courses in women and spirituality and women in the Bible, teaching associate in biblical and classical Greek University at the University of Minnesota. She taught computer-assisted biblical Greek at University of Minnesota, instructor in classical and biblical Greek, Department of Extension, University of Minnesota, also supervised independent study projects, taught two courses on women in the Bible with her husband, Richard Krager, at Eastern New Mexico University, out in New Mexico. I mean, they get around tutoring in Latin and Greek, and she has many published works. And she's the one we're going to tell you about her new book that will be coming out soon. I tell you what, uh, ushers, at the close of this session, when Catherine's finished, I would like to pass out those leaflets that's on her table. Um, I Suffer Not a Woman is the head of it. That's not going to be the title of the book, but that's the title of the leaflet. Have it ready so we can pass it out, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do about it. She has many published articles. If you get Christianity Today and you get some of these ma magazines, let me see. Let me tell you some of the things that she's published. The Apostle Paul uh, and Homosexuality, uh, Women, Authority of the Bible. She contributed that book that uh, Elvira and Dr. Michelson put together, The Apostle Paul and the Greco-Roman Cults of Women. A classicist looks at the difficult passages. She is a specialist on 1 Timothy 2. And I think all of us in here that ha has heard her would agree on that. The classical concept of head as source. But can she type? This woman has wit also. See, none of these people are starchy. Did you think Gretchen was starchy last night? <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be where they are if they didn't have a sense of humor. You got to laugh your way to the top, believe me. <laughs> the other disciples, pandemonium and silence at Corinth, and many of these things are here and available for sale. Ancient heresies and a strange Greek verb. May women teach the people who resettled Corinth, women elders, sinners or servants. She's my kind of woman. Women in the church. And then, of course, her book that will soon be published, many papers. She is a founding organizer and co-chair of Consultation on Women in the Biblical World of the Society of Biblical Literature, founding organizer and co-chair of Women in the Biblical World section of the Society of Biblical Literature, organizer with Stanley Gundry and David Scholler of Colloquium of Evangelical Scholars on Biblical Perspectives on Women, founding organizer of Christians for Biblical Equality, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I tell you all of that to tell you, women and men, don't be intimidated, study. You can go anywhere from where you are. You can build all knowledge on what your roots already are if you're rooted in the true faith, biblical faith, and if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So without further comment, I'm going to introduce to you now Dr. Katherine Clark Krager. Stand up and please receive this wonderful woman of God. Are you wired? Are you supposed to have a musical number first? No, that's going to be at break. Are you turned on? I don't know. I think I am. You're on. Thank you. Good morning. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. <laughs> Good morning. Buenos dias. And Cassie, happy sweet 16. <laughs> I am so sorry, and my husband is so sorry, that he cannot be here. And we thank you for the prayer that went up for him during his surgery. It's a little disconcerting. We didn't know there was all that much wrong. And suddenly there was open heart surgery. And I know many, many of you prayed for you. Keep on praying. The doctor says he's making incredible recovery. And I would call Pat and say, Pat, play for Sam. He's in awful trouble in the intensive care. And Sam is out. He's in the recovery ward. Pray for Stan Cohen. There wasn't much hope he'd pull through. And I talked to that family. And Stan is doing, oh, just wonderfully well. <laughs> After having had it been nip and tuck, and people began to see that prayer really does change things. Now, I have a big order today because I'm going to try to, to pinch hit and do some of the things my husband usually does as well as the things I do. You see, he was going to talk to you about all the things in Genesis 
And then I was going to pick it up and recycle it in the New Testament. So let's begin with Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you recall that God said, let there be light. Now I have a son. Actually, I have two sons. I'll probably tell you about quite a few of my kids before I get done. But this son is a high energy physicist. That means he tries to pull apart all the little things that are running around inside an atom. And he says that they do this in order to figure out how it all got put together in the first place. And I said, well, what do the scientists say? It's very different from the days when I was in high school. Maybe it's even different from the days you're, you were in high school. I was always told the matter can be neither created nor destroyed. But now, even the most secular of scientists believe that there was a point in time, or maybe even before time existed, I guess you'd have to say, when there was a tremendous explosion of creativity, and that it was centered at one point, and that it was light. And these are the secular scientists who are saying this. And that there was this powerful and great original light. And that somehow out of this light came the tiny particles, uh, you know, way, way much smaller than um, the atom, things they call charm and beauty and, and truth and all these things. They don't mean what you and I mean by all that. But anyway, they uh, pulled together and formed the tiny, tiny building blocks. And my son said something else to me. He said, that light, that original light, is still present in the universe. You see, I'd always wondered, and other people have too, why, you know, God says, let there be light, and then it's day three, according to the Genesis account, before the sun and the moon and the stars are formed. How can you have light without lights? Well, modern physics and astrophysics are now starting to say something different. They say that that primordial light is still there. One of our satellites that was sent out was actually to explore this original light. Now, we can perceive it apparently in this world by radio, and also if you somehow get the temperature two degrees above absolute zero. I think I learned it was, that was minus 273 degrees Fahrenheit, so I guess that's minus 271. There's a much easier way to detect that original light, and that's with the antenna of faith. And that's available. And then we've started, that's available to us here by faith, whether we understand all this or not. You understand, I'm the dumb mother who doesn't understand this. I'm just the one who has to remember that this is the boy that doesn't like chocolate chip cookies. He'd rather have me send me oatmeal raisin. I mean, have me send him oatmeal raisin. But he says something else to me that blew my mind even further. You know, we started to talk about, well, what holds all these particles together? He said, well, that's light too. The Bible says that Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. The Bible says that by him all things consist. That's an old King James way of saying by, by him all things hold together. That light that is the light of men. Isn't that an exciting word? You know, so what else he tells me is that um, all kinds of uh, very secular scientists who have use only for the material world have become Jews and Christians because of what they read in the Genesis account. But I want to talk to you about a Lord of life and a Lord of light who holds not only all things, material things, these tiny particles that I don't understand at all, but he holds you and me together. He holds male and female together by the word of his power. And sometimes we haven't had the eyes of faith to see this. And so I want to talk to you about this this morning. If you brought your Bibles, and I do hope you did, let's turn first to Genesis 5. Now, am I making? Just fix this. It's oh. on the badge. Oh, it's on my badge, and it's making rumbling noises. Mm -hmm. It's a good place. Um, if you want, I can just yell loud, and oh, we can keep I on going. Okay. I think maybe the best way to understand, you remember um, that the wor world was without form and void. And God gives the world form, and God fills up the world with all kinds of wonderful things. I've heard said that it's absolutely incredible that in the, in the Genesis account, it should make the very close association between birds and sea creatures. Scientists tell us that there's a very close connection there. And uh, then the mammals and so on get created later. And then on the sixth day comes that wonderful creation, the human being. 
Now, um, I remember one time my naughty kids came home from school. In fact, if I must confess it was the same high energy physicist, but a few years younger, who said, yeah, we went to Sunday school today, Ma, and they said that God created Adam, and then he made a subhuman species of monster spelled G-I-R-L. <laughs> well, either that uh, Sunday school teacher was doing a very rotten job, or he was pulling my leg. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 5. Every time that uh, there are several breaks in the book of Genesis, and each time we read, these are the generations. So this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Now, a lot of people believe this. They say, yeah, it's true. Man is made in God's image, and then woman is just in the image of God. That's not what it says. We're going to, I mean, woman is just in the image of man. Both male and female are created in God's image. And one of the hardest things I ever, ever have to do is to teach women that they are made in God's image, that they are worth something, that they are worthy of the death of Jesus Christ who gave his life for their sakes, and that they are fully human and fully part of God's image. So God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them. You see, the first human being actually contained within him both male and female. So God blessed them and called their name Adam. Did you know that the word Adam, of course, is a name, Adam, but it also is a word man? Uh, and so we have to understand that, that when God is talking about Adam, uh, sometimes it just means humanity. He called their name man or humanity in the day when they were created. Woman as well as man created in God's image. Maybe it says it even better in Genesis 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man. Now, some people think this is a, a royal we, you know. Other people think it is God talking within himself. You know. Within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is a family. And God says, let us make humanity in our image, after our likeness. Now, that doesn't mean hands and feet and nose and so on. Some imagine God as, you know, sort of a big giant. I, I once heard of a young woman who was raised in a farm background, and she always pictured God, since he was like a father, as wearing bib overalls. God doesn't wear bib overalls, neither does he wear a long white robe. <laughs> God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So then God says that he's going to make humanity and let them, do you hear the plural? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, some people think that just man was supposed to have dominion over the earth. But how many people does it take to fill the earth and to multiply? It takes two. In fact, they have to be each of a special gender for this to happen. And God gives this mandate for dominion to both male and female. There is complete equality in this picture. We often do not see it. We read things into it. Uh, <clears throat> but it is made very clear in the beginning that male and female are both given jobs to do. They are both supposed to reflect God's glory. Uh, if you're a, an image, you're supposed to reflect. Uh, the spiritual nature of God, the love of God, the passion for truth which God has, the concern for others, the relationality, all this is what we are supposed to have. Now, each time that God has created something on the earth, you know, each day he looks at it and says it is very good. But now that he has created Adam, and we get around to that in chapter 2, for the first time God says it is not good. 
It is not good that man should be alone. I will create a help of his like. Uh, God didn't say, I'm going to create Girl Friday. God didn't say, I'm going to create a sidekick. <clears throat> the words in English, and I know Lenore and Ken would tell you this, are etzer conecto, one just like me. Uh, one having the same feelings, emotions, being able to be a companion. And etzer means helper. And you see, well, there you are. Let me tell you that this word occurs some 21 times in the Hebrew Bible. And two or three times it means human beings who aren't necessarily very helpful. But 18 times it refers to God. There is no put down in, you know, unto the hills shall I lift up, will I lift up mine eyes. From whence cometh my help? It's there. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. It is no put down to say that woman was called into being to be a helper and to be equal, to be like God. Now, a very interesting thing happens after God has said he's going to create uh, a helper. You know the next thing Adam does? I mean, God does? Run all the animals past. Isn't that strange? And Adam has to name them. Now, this didn't mean just, you know, thinking up a name, uh, Joe and Billy and so on. Uh, it meant looking at the animal, trying to understand something about that animal's nature. And when it gets all through, you know what the end result is? None of them will do for a fit companion, one who really understands, one with whom there can be spiritual dialogue and understanding. None of them are the fit helper. And so then God puts Adam to sleep and <coughs> brings forth from his side. The Hebrew can mean either rib or side from the very flesh of Adam, a second human being is formed. Now before this, Adam is able to name the animals, but he doesn't have anybody to engage in conversation with, so he doesn't engage in conversation. And you know what he does? He bursts into poetry. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is just like me, it's part of me, it's someone with whom I can share, someone whom I can love, someone who will understand me. Uh, and he bursts into a song of praise. Adam becomes a poet. Well, now I'm going to leave the Genesis story and talk about ways in which this material is used in the New Testament. Have you ever thought about the high-risk passages uh, in the New Testament and how much they go back to the Genesis story? And so where I want to pick up uh, in the New Testament is in this whole idea of woman being drawn forth from man and woman being made for the source of man. Being, woman being made for the, to, to serve man, I'm sorry. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is writing to what is probably the most sexually preoccupied city in the ancient world. Uh, Rome had some uh, considerable interest that way, but uh, a lot of the living that Corinthians derived was out of sex. A lot of the uh, interest that they had, a lot of what they talked about, debated, they used to enter into a lot of debates about which was a better way to go, homosexuality, heterosexuality, and so on. And when Paul talks to new believers, he has a lot of things to discuss with them. I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to start in the middle of things. There are many, many things in 1 Corinthians 11 that we might want to talk about, and I'm trying, going to try and move through them as fast as I can. Let's begin with verse 3. Perhaps we should begin with prayer. Open our eyes, O God, and show us marvelous things out of thy law. Now, I'm going to try to help you see this um, from the viewpoint of people who lived in ancient Greece and in the ancient world. And it means doing things differently. As I was scurrying around trying to get ready to leave, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who lives in Washington, D.C., but she has in-laws in Oklahoma, and she said, um, now, Mother, you've got to understand, in, in um, Oklahoma, people are different. They dress up nicely. Well, of course, Cape Cod casual, you know. Cape Cod wives, they have no pins. They pin their clothes with codfish pins. 
fins and uh, Cape Cod girls, they have no combs, they comb their hair with codfish bones. And I think she, she tried to tell me how nicely people think, do things. Certainly true, my goodness, look at this church and the way you treat us. And uh, she wasn't quite sure my Cape Cod casual was going to fit in. <laughs> now, Paul is trying to take this story, this story from Genesis that was first written in Hebrew to people who had a Hebrew understanding, and he's going to try to fit it into a different culture. Let's read it all together. Now, T.L. read to us from uh, Living Letters. When you come to the tough stuff on women, though, don't do this. I'm just going to read it to you from the Greek. I'll translate it, okay? This is Kathy's translation. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and man, the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man, when he prays or prophesies with his head uncovered, disgraces his head. And every woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered disgraces her head. For it is one and the same as if her head were shaven. Uh, <clears throat> for if a woman does not veil her head, then let her be, have her hair cut off. <clears throat> and that was, by the way, a, a disgrace. That's one of the things you did if women were unchaste. You did it for some other reasons, too. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Incidentally, it doesn't say woman is the image of man because she isn't. She's the image of God. We'll get around to the glory part in a little while. By the way, I think you all know Daisy's the glory of TL. <laughs> okay? All right. <clears throat> For man is not originally out of woman, but woman from man. And man was not created for the sake of the woman, but the woman for the sake of the man. Now, here's what you don't have translated right in your Bibles. Therefore, ought a woman to have power over her head because of the messengers. You've got everything but, huh? Uh, the word exousia, which is used here in the Greek, is not ever used of giving away power, but rather of exercising power or of having the free right of choice. <clears throat> Only neither is the woman without the man nor the man without the woman in the Lord. Isn't that good news? We belong to each other. The God who holds all things together by the might of the pow if his power holds you and me together, male and female. In Jesus Christ, there is no room for the battle of the sexes. And just as woman came forth out of the man, so now man comes out of the woman, and all things are of God. I think these two passages are some of the greatest passages in the Word on biblical equality. Neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the, the, or the neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. And just as woman comes forth from, came forth from man, so now man comes forth from women, and all things are of God. Now judge this. Is it suitable for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach that a man, if he has long hair, is a disgrace to himself? And that if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, <clears throat> because her hair is given to her as clothing. If anyone wants to make a fight about this, we don't have any such custom, nor does the Church of God. There's some real difficulties with this text, and we're going to have to work hard on it. But I want to begin <clears throat> by telling you about the Greek people and what they thought. You see, they thought it was a sheer disaster that women got created in the first place. And I would like to say that, uh, first of all, the Hebrew Bible teaches us that it was a good gift, a precious gift, a wonderful blessing that women were created. Uh, the pagan Greeks thought it was just the opposite. According to their story, uh, there was one giant that wanted to be nice to human beings. There were only men, of course, and nobody gave them fire. Well, now they could cook their food, they could keep warm, they could make tools, and so on. And Zeus was so mad at that giant named Prometheus that he took him and tied him to a mountain where a vulture could tear out his liver every day. But he was still mad, and he wanted to do something to get even with man, because man was going to be too powerful if he had fire. And so he decided to play a nasty trick on him. He decided instead to give him a woman. 
And the story goes that he had the blacksmith god hammer, and he took some from this animal and some from that. Of course, man had been made from the substance of Zeus, but woman is made from all the animals, the bitch and the vixen and so on. And then <clears throat> she is sent along to make man trouble, and uh, she is given a present of a jar. Now, inside the jar are all the troubles of the world. This woman, whose name is Pandora, that means all the gifts, doesn't know what she's got in the jar, but she's been told not to open it. Well, it just wouldn't hurt to do one teensy-weensy little peek, would it? And so she opens it to get one teensy-weensy little peek, and all the troubles of the world fly out. And that's why all the troubles are there. Now, <clears throat> here's one, what one poet said. Zeus, who thunders on high, made women to be an evil to mortal men with a nature to do evil. Women are so nasty that they just come into this world hell-bent on doing the wrong thing. They're hell-bent on destruction. And as for that giant, that giant who gets punished by having to have his, vault, you know, his uh, liver torn out every day, with brands of fire but naught else good can he be credited, but all the gods, me think, hate what he did in fashioning females a cursed brood. Now, when people started believing that it was a nasty trick on them, they started hating women even more because uh, it was such a bad thing to have them. And one poet said, oh, Zeus, why as a horrible evil did you create women in the first place? Was it to propagate the human race? Then you choose the wrong way. Why didn't you let us go to the temples and with weight of gold buy sons? None of this other baby-making business. And what are we going to do with them when they're not? making babies. I mean, to talk to them is sheer disaster. You couldn't even expect the slaves to talk to them. The only people they're fit to talk to is animals. And if you somehow end up marrying a bright woman, that's worse yet. Paul had to write to people who hated women, who believed that women were just trying to make them trouble and were bad. Now, the worst of it was that even some of the Jewish people had bought into this. And not only does Paul take the Genesis story and recycle it to tell it to people, but Jewish people who were influenced by Greek ideas started to do the same thing. In fact, any time you find Jewish writing that's written in Greek, watch out. It's usually full of women-hating stuff. For instance, there's one story as the Genesis story gets retold, and um, God is talking. He says, and I took from Adam a rib and created him a wife, that death should come to him by his wife. Watch out for women, they're evil. Their minds are always set on doing you bad things, and the whole reason they got made was to bring death to the world. They are treacherous, and they're gonna kill you. Do you see why people got uneasy? why it rubbed off in the way people were treated. And women were treated despicably. I had one professor who used to say that women were treated worse than the cattle in the barnyard. And in many respects, that's true. Now, it does make a difference what you believe about how women got created in the first place. I have another son who's a missionary, and his duty is to translate the Bible into a language that has never had a written language before. Uh, he tells about another group, not the one he's working with. I think this group was in Papua New Guinea. And in their folk beliefs, uh, originally there had been two men that had been created. And one of them did something very, very bad. And so to punish him, the gods turned him into a woman. <laughs> now, when they got the Genesis translated, and they saw that God from the beginning had made male and female as equal, it changed their whole attitude toward women. And the whole society began to change. If we understand God's word, it does make a difference. The Bible says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. And light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. This is God's good news. But then you say, it says that woman was created for the sake of man. Man wasn't created for woman's sake, but woman was created for man's sake. That's a put down, huh? Well, no. 
when Paul uses this very same term many times in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, probably you know the one where he says in 1st Corinthians 4.10, we are fools for Christ's sake. Is that a put down? Maybe it is to be a fool, but not to do it for Christ's sake. And then there's a time when Paul is trying to explain something. He doesn't think they quite understand. The Corinthians are just like me, a little bit retarded, a slow learner. And so Paul says, now I'm trying to explain this for your sakes, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And 1 Corinthians 9, 10, uh, he writes, he says this wholly for our sakes, for it is written for our sakes. Does that degrade the scripture to say that it is written for our sakes? Or is that representing ministry? At 9.23, Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. A put down or an, an ennobling purpose in his life. We are your servants for Christ's sake. In 1 Corinth, I mean, 2 Corinthians 4.5. In 2 Corinthians 4.11, we are given over to death for Christ's sake. All things are for your sakes, 2 Corinthians 4.11. And the one we love best of all, Jesus, who was, though he was rich, yet he became poor for your sakes. That's ministry, 2 Corinthians 8.9. And so people sometimes say to me, well, do you believe in the ministry of women? And I say, oh, yes, the Bible says that's why we got created in the first place. Uh, man just couldn't do without us. <laughs> now, another idea that they have and that I touched on a little bit already was the idea that man was noble and woman was ignoble. Man was made from the substance of the gods and woman was made from the substance of animals. For instance, one of the poets who wrote a lot about early beginnings and Greeks really believe what he said, uh, said that uh, Zeus made woman with a shameless mind and a deceitful nature. Right into the essence of her being uh, is something very degraded and bad. Uh, another one of the poets started naming all the animals people were made from. Uh, first of all, there were people that were made from the earth and all they could do was eat. And uh, <coughs> then there was a woman made from a sow and she was lazy, fat, and filthy. Another was a vix, made from a zi, uh, vixen, and um, then, then those that were made from the earth too were dumb. Such a woman knoweth neither good nor evil, her only art is to eat. In the beginning, God made woman with a mind apart from man's. She can't think like a man. You can't communicate with her. You know people who believe that? Often it's because we have pushed women in a corner and kept them out of things. And when Paul says a woman should go home and talk with her husband, that's not an insult. It's trying to start communication in a family where there was very, very little communication. Men and women did very, very little talking together. Uh, one time Socrates was having a conversation with a man uh, who said that his wife had been a 14-year-old girl kept in leading reins. Who do you keep with bit and bridle and leading reins? A horse. And he said he had to domesticate her. Who do you domesticate? Animals. He finally got her to the point where she could have a conversation. She could understand he's going to teach her how to te keep house. And Socrates began to say, this really isn't fair. And suddenly he said, who do you talk to any less than your own wife? No one, Socrates. And yet, who do you vest with any greater responsibility? No one, Socrates. You see, they believed that women were always second class, always second rate. In fact, they said it was impossible for a woman ever to be as good as a man. That's why you always had to turn to a homosexual partner. Male who was noble needed another noble male for communication. You couldn't even find this with women. Uh, even these same Jews who got bought in so hard with the Greeks said, better is the wickedness of a man than the goodness of a woman. The Aristotle said the worst man is better than the most virtuous woman. And the bravest woman is always a cowardly custard 
compared to the most scared, timid male. And so <clears throat> the idea that there would be one flesh, that there would be a human being who shared the same substance, who shared the same feelings, who didn't like to be pushed around any more than a man liked to be pushed around. A woman who can lay hold of the same God. A person whose spiritual experience is just as valid as that of the male. This idea of flesh of flesh and blood of the same blood is terribly important in the gift that God gives, giving man and woman one to another. Now, twice in this passage that I read to you in 1 Corinthians 11, it spoke of woman being taken out of man. And I suggest that this is not a put down, but a put beside, a sharing together. I wanted to talk to you next about the word head. Remember, we started out by saying that the head of the man is Christ, the head of Christ is God, and the head of a woman is the man. Now somebody says, uh-huh, and that means boss. Well, it depends on which culture you're talking about. Now, just as I told you, um, people in Tulsa are very up and coming, and in Cape Cod, people are pretty casual. Uh, and sometimes words mean different things in different parts of the country. Like, some people call it soda, and some people call it pop, okay? And some people call it tonic. Depends on what, you, you know, what you're going to ask for if you want a glass of ginger ale. Um, in the same way, people in the Hebrew language sometimes used head to mean boss. But in Greek, it usually didn't have that meaning. Of course, it could mean the topmost part of your body. It could even mean the topmost part of a pillar. It could mean the chapter heading. We still speak about chapter heading, right? The thing that kind of sums everything else and pulls it all together. It could mean um, the beginning or the source of something. I'll tell you a cute little story about that up in Minnesota. Uh, the explorers were looking for the source or the head of the Mississippi. Now, the truth of the matter is there's a lake and several little springs you know, bring water into it. And so all you can say is, well, it just seems to begin in, in this particular lake. And the explorer called his chaplain. Now, I'm sorry to tell you this chaplain didn't know Latin very well, even though he was, well, I won't go into that. Uh, but Latin has sometimes been pretty shaky. And so the explorer said to him, tell me what the Latin word is for true head. Well, he got it a little bit wrong. He said it's veritas caput. That means truth head. The explorer thought for a little while. He said, that's too long. So we'll just call it Itasca. And to this very day, we have Lake Itasca in Minnesota, the source of the Mississippi River. The head, the true head. And in just a moment, I am going to show you how the Greeks had this same understanding of head as source or beginning. Now, twice we've had the idea that woman came forth from man, that he was her head or her source. And you say, well, but other people say it means boss. Well, then I think we have to look into the nature of God himself. You see, if we say women um, are subordinate, they're the second class people, are we saying that Christ is second class in comparison to the Father? This becomes a very dangerous doctrine. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And again, he says, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. John 16, 15, all that the Father has is mine. And he prays to the Father in John in 17. And he prays that all believers may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they may be one in us. And we could go on and give many examples where Jesus calls on the Father to do things. For instance, John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have indeed glorified it and will glorify it again. The Son took upon himself the form of a servant for our salvation to come into this world. And the Spirit was sent forth 
And Jesus said that he would ask the Father and that the Father would, um, this is John 14, 16 and 26, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter so that he may be with you forever. And the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. You see, there's sort of an interchanging. They call upon one another. There is a mutual submission within the Godhead. I think some of the other people are going to deal more with this. Um, otherwise, maybe I will get back to this. The idea of the interdependence of the Godhead. But I wanted to explain to you that if we do not understand God as being three persons, yet one God, equal in power and goodness and love, uh, we get into some very serious trouble. If we say, uh, as some people nowadays are, uh, the uh, woman is second rate, there's even subordination within the Godhead. There is servanthood. There's a lot of servanthood, and there's servanthood for each one of us. Um, helper means being servant, but it also uh, involves the idea of mutuality, of helping one another, and this is important. But the early fathers began to deal with this, and they said, how should you understand this Bible passage when it speaks here of God as head of Christ and man as head of woman? Does this mean inferiority or subordination? And St. John Chrysostom, a Greek-speaking father who preached right through the, the Bible, and we still have many, many of his sermons uh, expounding the Word of God. And he said, how do you understand it? He said, no, if Paul had meant inferiority, he'd have talked about man and slave, not man and wife. He wasn't always that kind. But he said, now, how are some people going to look at this word, head? He said, well, some of them are going to think it means inferiority, but I'll tell you about that crowd. They're heretics. <laughs> and uh, he said Paul intended to show equality. How then, he asked, should we understand the word head? And here's the answer he gave. When you read the word head in this Bible passage, understand it in the sense of perfect unity. Have you ever thought of a head and body parting company? Neither does very well without the other and understand it as primal cause and source. Christ, who made all things by the word of his power and brought man into being. A uh, man from whom woman was drawn forth and God from wh the Father from whom both Christ and the Holy Spirit proceed. A wonderful unity. Now, as I told you, I'm a classicist. I'm the kind of person who likes to let the ancient people talk for themselves. Or in this case, I, I've read you some of the things they've written, and now I want to have you, you look at some of the things. Could we have uh, the pictures, please? Uh, you know, the Chinese say a peep is as good as a thousand words. And so we're going to have that peep. I hope I'm not standing in anybody's way. Could we darken the lights? And the very first picture I'm going to show you comes from the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, this is a bas-relief that was set up there about 150 years before Christ. And it is going to show us the head or source. Oh, I did it wrong, and it's my fault because I put those slides in. We've got it upside down. Now, we can either ask to have it changed. Uh, maybe we should ask to have it changed and get a little bit darker. This is a line drawing, but I'll tell you what you're going to see when you see it right side up. You see, the Greeks believed that the source of moisture was from the head. And one of the proofs of that was um, the amount of hair that we have on our bodies. Uh, well, I just think some men even manage to get whiskers. Sure enough, uh, here are the, the whiskers. And we can see that the, the head, uh, the face down here is part bull and part man. Do you see the bull's horns? They even believed that sperm, human semen, was created in the head. And then it went down the spinal column and out to give life. They thought the head was the source, the beginning, the origin. Now you'll notice some of the other great gods and goddesses sitting around. How much of their body do you see? How much of the bodies of the other gods sitting around do you see? All of them. But how much do you see of the river god? 
just his head. Now this was set up at the source of the river. Why don't we have the rest of the God's body there? It's the river going on down. Uh, but here we have a clear indication that people in the Isthmus of Corinth uh, felt that source uh, could mean head, and head means source, uh, as it applied to river and some other things. Let's look at the next slide, please. Now we're in southern Italy, and uh, what a weird statue. Would you like to have that in your house? I mean, uh, one woman standing on top of another. Uh, this is actually a human soul who is coming up out of the head of the goddess of, dead, of death, Persephone. Greeks believed, certain of them, that people were reincarnated after being dead for nine years. And so rather than just put flowers in somebody's grave, you could put one of these nice little reminders that after nine years, Persephone would send them up. But where is she issuing from? Do any of you remember the story of Athena and how she got born? Anybody remember where she got born from? The head of Zeus popped out. Uh, the concept of head as source, a point of origin, beginning. Um, now I wanted to look at you. I think I have a tour to show you one or two other things that have to do. Can we keep on going? Um, I wanted to tell you about some people who are worshiping. Uh, Paul says that the people of Corinth were carried away by dumb idols. Uh, you can see that it was lots of fun and games uh, to worship this way. Uh, you did a lot of dancing. Women often, uh, in fact, these uh, special mountain occa dancing occasions happened every other year in the middle of the winter, and women left their babies, they left their housework, they left home, and they were gone for two or three days. I believe that's one of the things submission is talking about that you follow through on your responsibilities and you don't ditch everybody and everything. But these Greek women are uh, saying that they're worshiping Dionysus. There are a few men running around here too. Dionysus is their big liberator. He frees them from shuttle and from loom. Next slide, please. Ah, here we have a dancer. Okay. Uh, she is uh, having her fun and games. She may not be allowed out of the house at all, anytime except to worship Dionysus and she's making the most of it. All right, the next one, please. Um, now, this woman is uh, a little bit uh, beside herself, and that happened very often. Part of the worship of Dionysus was that you were in an altered state of consciousness. And um, unfortunately, this woman has a panther. One of the things these women did was to tear the animals apart and eat the flesh while it was raw, warm, and quivering. Wouldn't you just love to have those ladies come to church? Paul had to deal with them. And uh, one of the things he said at one point is, watch out how you behave in church or people will think you're carrying on this way. OK, let's look at the next one. Uh, this shows you an actual altar from the first century. The other pictures I showed you were earlier. I just wanted you to know that this kind of thing was still going on in the first century, OK? Uh, uh, these are pictures just before the first century AD, They're the first century BC, and they show some other women worshiping. And this was painted on a wall in Pompeii. This one is pretty polite, OK? Some of the others aren't so polite. Uh, that one's still all right. It shows probably a woman getting ready to be married, having a special worship service. Let's look at the next one. Oh, oh. Do you see why Paul wants women's heads covered? One of the reasons? Uh, if you keep their heads covered and so on, you might keep some other clothes on too. All right, let's, I think we've got a couple more. Oh, that looks like the same one again. All right, let's go on to the next one. That woman is being beaten. Here's a modern artist's idea of what's happening. Um, but it, it shows a type of worship that women had to be restrained from. They had to be taught how to behave themselves to worship with other Christians and people who'd come out of a Jewish background. OK, let's look at the next one. Um, here again, we see some ladies worshiping um, without proper clothing. And Paul's emphasis on propriety cannot be commended enough if he was going to make Jew and Gentile one in Christ Jesus. When the wall came down uh, and the wall that Christ broke down divided in the temple male and female, and that wall came down too in Jesus Christ. 
but Paul had to work hard to get people to behave right. All right, next one, please. Uh, these are pictures showing men dressed up as women. This is actually a man in women's clothes. Remember that this says what a man ought to wear and what a woman ought to wear. And there was a lot of clothing reversal. Okay, let's look at the next one. Isn't he cute? All dressed up like a lady. See, the hat that a woman would wear in the house. Uh, of course, he's going out on the streets, and this would be during a worship service of the pagan god Dionysus. In the New Testament period, people were switching clothes. And I believe this is one of the things Paul is speaking out against. We know that Samson had long hair. We know that Absalom had long hair. The Greeks speak of the long-haired Achaeans who went into battle at the Trojan War. But I think Paul is repudiating this idea of switching and wearing each other's clothes. Next one, please. Oh, aren't they having fun? And look at their cute little parasols, all right? Uh, and here they are hopping and skipping. This represents the kind of thing that the poet Aristophanes would, would write. Uh, men would get dressed up as women, and here the bottoms are even padded, OK? I kind of like him. <laughs> uh, and, and there were two festivals during the year when they would tend to do this, although if you had a good drinking party, after all, Dionysus was the god of wine. All right, so uh, you could do, when you had a drinking party, you could carry this on. Here we see uh, a woman dancing before the god Dionysus. This is actually from Corinth. And you see she has put on satyr pants with the male organ actually attached. This concept of sex reversal. And Paul repudiates this. He says, if you're a man, that's good. If you're a woman, that's good. Hang on to the identity of who you are. You don't have to go exchanging it. All right, let's look at the next one. Uh, and here is Dionysus himself dressed up as uh, a, uh, a woman. Uh, he himself was a god whose sexual identity was sort of blurred. Um, that isn't where Paul is. Paul affirms men, he affirms women. And he glorifies Jesus Christ, who has made us one in him. And that's all for today, folks. teacher.